Dear parents or guardians, in compliance with the 85th legislature, Senate Bill 1566, Section 14, Subchapter A, Chapter 38, Section 38.031, we are required to inform parents that a student or students in your children's grade level have been found to have head lice. There is no law in our state that addresses excluding children with head lice from school. Lice are not a public threat. They do not carry disease. As such, the Department of Health and State Service does urge school districts to ensure that its policies and procedures do not cause children to miss class unnecessarily. Our goal is to keep all parents informed about identified cases of head lice and how to treat and prevent them. Our challenge is to accomplish this without causing embarrassment and isolation for students who suffer from cases of head lice. Thank you in advance for working with our school to make sure that we have the best possible environment for our students. I've dealt with head lice before. Some girl brought it over when Misty, my oldest, had a sleepover about two years ago. I thought I knew what to do, and since the email came through Thursday night, I thought that I would have time to handle it. I immediately got Jonah out of his school clothes and told him to get in the shower and soap his hair thoroughly. My plan was to run down to CVS and buy some strong ivermectin. I know the stuff kind of stinks, but it does the trick. Well, that never happened. Instead, as I tossed his clothes in the dryer and then began to do the same thing with his bed sheets, I realized he was taking longer in the shower than normal and shouted to him, Is everything okay? When he didn't respond, I became worried. I rattled the door and eventually got it loose, running into the bathroom to see that he had collapsed unconscious in the shower. Immediately, I dialed 911 and turned off the water. I started checking him for injuries, especially the head. And that was when I saw what the school had said. It was lice. These did not look like tiny little insects that I had seen on Misty. They looked a little bigger, with larger pincers in it. A little more aggressive than a typical head lice. It looked like when Jonah had washed his hair, they had begun to dig into his scalp to keep him from drowning, and caused his skin to become even more agitated. The paramedics came in less than 10 minutes, and we made it to the hospital in about 30. I told them what I had saw, and they ordered tests. When they got back and we were waiting on results, I asked him how he was feeling. My whole head is on fire, he admitted. They had placed bandages on the irritated skin, and I told him to lean forward so I can get a better look. Pulling the gauze away, I found myself stifling back a wail as I saw the redness in his scalp was now much worse, and the strange tiny creatures that were digging into his skin had gone even deeper, creating cuts in his flesh. I called for a nurse and asked if there was any way for us to just shave his head and begin immediate treatment, but she insisted I needed to wait for a doctor. Jonah kept scratching and scratching, even making himself bleed, and I eventually couldn't wait any longer and went to find the shavers myself. On the way to the nurse's station, I ran into one of the techs that had been running a scan of Jonah, and I asked if the results were in. He told me no, but offered to assist me with the shaving. We hurried back to the room, and I told Jonah to turn his head, and we took off the wrappings, and the tech covered his mouth in shock. It looked like the top of my son's head was peeling off and rotting the way an old banana does. Scars and bruises seemed to cover the part of the scalp that we could see, and something told me when we began to shave, things would get even worse. I told Jonah to remain still as the tech started the process, but it wasn't easy. I could see that when the blade was cutting his hair, it was also causing pain to my son. I gripped his hand and I tried to hold him, but it wasn't working. The creatures were burrowing deeper into his scalp, and when we got down to the bare skin, I could see that everything we were doing was only causing him more harm than good. I told the tech to stop, tears welling in my eyes as I held Jonah, and he moaned in pain. That kept going for twenty minutes until the main ER doctor entered the room with the results. His face told me that it wasn't what I would want to hear. We've never seen anything like this before he said, as he showed me what the scans revealed. The insects were larger than I anticipated, longer and cylindrical. They had dug straight into my son's skin and even hit his bone. And it looked like they were intending to go deeper. This could cause brain damage if left untreated. 
I recommend a full round of broad spectrum antibiotics, and then we schedule Jonah for surgery to get these removed, the doctor said. I asked him how long that might be, and he told me the only pediatric surgeon wasn't available until Monday. Me, my son, would be writhing in pain and experiencing possible damage in his mental health because no one here is qualified, I asked in shock. They admitted there was little more they could do, but they attempted to contact other hospitals in the Tri-County area. I sat there for an hour trying to decide what I should do as Jonah continued to try and scratch. Eventually, I asked the nurse to bind his hands to a stretcher as I realized his nails were ripping off bits of flesh. The nurses and other staff seemed to begin to give us a wide berth, and I got the idea they were frightened by the unusual conditions as well. Another hour passed, and they gave Jonah a sedative to let him rest as I checked his scalp. The damage these things had done to my son's head was beyond horrific. They had caused large scars to cover every bit of his forehead and cranial area, eating up his skin and burning away any of his tissue and muscles. I could even see faint hints of his skull where there was bruising. In that moment, I sobbed and took out my phone. Desperation made me call Jonah's dad, someone that I hadn't talked to in almost two years. I can pull some strings and get to him a surgeon, but we'll have to drive all night to get here, he said. I told him it was worth it, and then demanded they let me check Jonah out so that we could begin the drive. Of course, the doctors advised otherwise, but I wasn't about to just let him lay there suffering for a few more days. Putting him in the back seat of the car, I gave him pillows and blankets to keep him comfortable and began the drive. It was so late and I was exhausted, but I pushed through, constantly checking the rearview mirror to see his condition. He woke up about an hour into the drive, moaning in pain and asking me to pull over. Sweetie, I can't. I'm trying to get you to a doctor, I told him. He began to vomit blood in the back seat and I braked hard. Putting my flashes on, I got out of the way of oncoming traffic and unbuckled. It hurts so bad, Mom, he said. I offered him the last of the pain pills as I stared at the bandages around his head. They were soaked in blood from the damage these insects were causing. He tried his best to swallow it. Then I laid him back down and gave him a McDonald's bag to keep puking into. I had to focus on the drive. My mom called about ten minutes later, checking on us and reporting that Misty was sound asleep. How's our boy? Did you get that lice handled? She asked. She seemed to think my trip to the hospital was an overreaction, and before I could explain the situation, he vomited again, and I hung up. All Jonah could do was shake and scream, begging me to give him more medicine, but I had nothing to offer. I sped up, placing my emergency flashers on. I had to get to my ex-husband as quickly as possible. I made it there by 3.30 in the early morning, and drizzle came down as I pulled my car up to the ER that he told me to head for. Jonah had been scratching again and the bandages were torn apart. His head hardly had any skin left and was now just a mangled mess of blood and loose hair and tissue. He pulled back his bloody nails and I saw bits of bone from his skull were also tearing off. As the rain hit his scalp, he shuddered in agony. My God, my ex said when he saw how bad it was and they rushed our son towards the operating room. He had dozens of questions, but neither me nor any of the surgeons had answers. They began to get Jonah prepped for an attempt at extracting these damn bugs when we got more bad news. Scans reveal these things are like fishing barbs. They burrow deep through the skin and the tissue and then latch on to prevent themselves from being taken easily. There's a risk this could cause more harm to your son than good, the head surgeon told us. I was trying my best not to hyperventilate. Just do whatever you have to do to help him, I begged. They promised me that they would. I had to sign a mountain of paperwork which gave them consent and, of course, waived any liabilities. Jonah was unconscious from the pain, but his body was still reacting to it. His stats were rising along with his core body temperature. I was certain that the insects were already attacking his brain. Thankfully, my ex-husband didn't have the opportunity to spew hateful words at me about being an awful mother. Instead, we were both in an almost catatonic state as we waited for some good news. But good news never came. 
The doctors came out about an hour later to inform us that Jonah was not showing any signs of brain activity. His body's still fighting, but it doesn't look like he'll be returning home the way that he came here, they admitted. One of the surgeons said this gave them an opportunity to quit being cautious, and they began to extract the slimy, writhing bugs. When I got a chance to see one before they killed it, the thing reminded me of a long, thin centipede covered in prickly needles. I'm certain that it hissed and shrieked as the doctors crushed it and continued to remove others. Six hours later, there was no bugs left. And our son was in a medically induced coma. It felt like I was dying, seeing him suffer. And I felt powerless not knowing if he was going to be okay. I found sleep only thanks to exhaustion. When I woke up, it was this morning and I charged my phone. Mom had called me twice. Hey, sorry I missed your call. Yeah, Jonah's fine, I said groggily. No, no, it's fine. I just wanted to give you a heads up about Misty. I became more alert almost instantly. Is something the matter? Well, it's just that she's complaining about her head itching really badly. What? Is she okay? My heart dropped at her response. I'm sure she's fine. I sent her to school. You know, she has that field trip today. I mean... It's just head lice, right? For those of you guys that like getting cozy while listening to stories, I'm going to let you know about Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. That's my wife's tea shop. She sells hand blended teas. There's creepy pasta based teas if you want to get one that's a flavor that you like. Or there's Mr. Creepy Pasta Tea, which happens to be a tea that I drink fairly often. You can also ask for a dabbing sticker. If you ask her for a dabbing sticker, you get a special one that I made for her to use on that jar, and she told me not to use it. So I like telling you guys to go ask her, because then you get a special one, because then she's forced to admit that I made a really good concept, even though it's very silly. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canazales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estebean, Nick Cull, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Love a Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Fike Mel, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, William King, Darth Myver, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricket, Ready Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.